Hi, this is Dr. Botwin. This is Status, Prestige, and Social Dominance. Lecture 16, Volume 2, Psych 150, Evolutionary Psychology. In this unit, we'll look at a variety of cues that people use to show their dominance and different ways of dominance is expressed. Here's a guy we've seen before. This is George Patton inspecting his troops during World War II demonstrating some dominant behaviors. Uh, so let's look at some characteristics of dominant individuals. First of all, they stand at full height. You see he's not slouching. Dominant individuals don't slouch. They look at others while talking. They make eye contact. Uh, eye contact is a major source of dominant behavior. If you look at many other species, eye contact is critical for dominance. If you have a pet, I'm sure you've tried playing the good old stare-each-other-down game. Hopefully you win and your dog or cat doesn't. But dominant behavior oftentimes involves staring someone down, making full eye contact. Dominant people speak a lot. They speak in a loud voice. They don't speak in little shriveling voices. They don't smile a lot. Uh, smiling is actually a sign of submissiveness. Uh, and verbally, or facially, excuse me, I should say, it comes across as a smile, as submissiveness. Frowning, the opposite of that, is an aggressive behavior. Also, dominant people walk very quickly. And they tend to uh, just speed across other people. If you ever walk across campus with some dominant people, and you're now a dominant person, you're going to be left behind in the fray. Well, I have a little bit of a talk that you'll see the whole video from, uh, from uh, Robert Winston and the Instinct series, but this bit fits especially here, so you're going to get a rerun. Here's Robert Winston. Places as being more dominant than others. They tend to have prominent brow ridges and bigger jaws, becoming deeper and wider. Whereas a less dominant face is subtly different. The face is rounder with a smaller, less prominent jaw and chin. The forehead is more vertical, altogether more like a child's. And the features which make for a dominant face are no coincidence. Prominent brows and a bigger jaw are linked to high levels of the male hormone testosterone. And in adult men, testosterone is linked to physical prowess. So dominant faces send an ancient signal of physical fitness. And it takes just a fraction of a second for us to make a judgment about a face. In that split second, we work out not only if we recognize it, but we also determine how dominant it is. So can a winning face make a difference? Researchers studied cadets from the class of 1950 at the Elite American Military Academy, West Point. They rated their faces for dominance. One of the cadets was Wallace H. Nutting. He went on to fight in both Korea and Vietnam. Today he is retired after 35 years of service. He rose to become a four-star general, one of the highest ranks in the U.S. Army. Back in 1950, his face was rated as one of the most dominant of his year. So does he think his face had anything to do with his success? I suppose facial features uh, have a lot to do with it, because when we meet one another for the first time, certainly we evaluate, we make some snap judgments uh, based on how a person looks. Almost all the graduates in 1950 who went on to become four-star generals also rated very highly in facial dominance. But even though strong faces appeared to have an influence, 
the scientists acknowledge that performance has the crucial part to play. Ultimately, I would not think one might be damned in the profession because he didn't have a big jaw or, or prominent brows or, or whatever, but it's not the be-all end-all. But undoubtedly, it can be a help. But we don't just respond instinctively to faces. We also make snap judgments about people by the way they act. Okay, folks. Um, so it shows you a little bit about facial features. Another sign of testosterone is height. And we like our leaders to be tall. Uh, Abraham Lincoln is known for his height. He accentuated that with the uh, stovepipe top hat. And he was one of our taller presidents. Here is something from the British newspaper, the Daily Journal. And you see, um, at the time, uh, this was before the last presidential election, the height of current leaders. Uh, Barack Obama, 6'1", David Cameron from the UK, 6'1", Tony Blair, former UK PM, 6 foot. I'm amazed that uh, Winston Churchill was only 5'6", and if you look at Mahapan Amajayan, the uh, Prime Minister of Iran, he comes in at 5'2". We all know he's pretty much of a figurehead leader in the context of uh, the religious mullahs who really run Iran. Uh, so height makes a difference. And even individuals we may know personally, our mental image of their height is exaggerated if we know them, if they tend to be of high social status. This is former President Welty. Uh, former President Welty was about 5'6". Uh, but he projected a far taller image. He only came up to my shoulder, but I always think of him as a much taller guy. Much research has shown that tall men have an advantage in being hired, promoted, paid, and elected. And tall men earn higher salaries. In fact, there is a theory out there called heightism. This is an elementary school picture here, but the data here is good. In the 20th century, uh, the taller of the two candidates won 83% of the time in presidential elections. And if you look here, you see Lincoln is the tallest president, 6'4", Washington, 6'2", uh, uh, Taft, 5'11", and they go down from there. Men who are tall believe themselves to be more qualified to be leaders and to demonstrate an act uh, excuse me, a greater interest in pursuing leadership positions than shorter guys do. Uh, so height tends to parlay itself into leadership ability. Here are all of the current living former presidents uh, by height. You can see George Bush Sr., a little bit taller than Obama, Clinton and George Bush Jr., uh, about the same height, and the smallest of the presidents, Jimmy Carter, who was probably the lowest of the dominance ratings of these individual presidents. Uh, however, uh, in contrast, I think he's probably been our finest ex-president. So height matters in choosing our leaders. If you remember during the last presidential uh, series of debates, uh, Hillary Clinton was placed on a uh, platform. So during the debate, she equaled the height of Donald Trump. Now here's an interesting study on walking speed and social economic status. This study was done in a business district in Bern, Switzerland. And uh, one researcher would watch a business person enter into an area, they time how fast they walked a city block. Then confederates of the researcher would be waiting on the other end 
to ask them a few questions about their relative social economic status. So on the one axis you see walking speed per millisecond. On the opposing axis, axis, excuse me, you see social economic status. And you see the numbers are the individuals at each level of SES. Men on uh, men's numbers and demographics on the top, women's on the bottom. Uh, men are represented by the closed circles, women by the open circles. Now notice that for the men, you get a pretty strong, and uh, I would guess it's about a 0.8 correlation between walking speed and social economic status. If you look at the women's walking speed and social economic status, you see the um, walking speed is pretty consistent uh, no matter how fast or no matter what level the SES the women are at. Uh, here's a classic psychology third variable problem. Uh, you've probably figured it out already. If not, just take a second to do so. This is a classic third variable problem where another variable intercedes to, uh, let's say, uh, obviate, uh, obfuscate a linear relationship. In this case, it's a business district, it's Europe. Most likely, the business women are wearing high-heeled shoes, which slows down their walking speed no matter what their SES is. Uh, having only worn platform shoes during the 70s and being extremely happy, that phenomena hasn't returned for guys. Uh, I can tell you wearing two-inch platform heels slow you down. Couldn't tell you how uh, much it would slow you down to wear three-inch high heels, uh, but women have told me it kind of slows them down a bit. Well, let's look at dominance in terms of testosterone. Now dominance and testosterone only figures in, excuse me, for men. And there is a large literature on hormones and social behavior that indicate the testosterone levels are associated with dominance and dominant behaviors that are intended to gain or maintain high status. Both naturally occurring and experimentally elevated levels of testosterone are positively associated with social rank and dominant behaviors in a variety of species. Here is a, uh, the ad here is a popular ad for a testosterone supplement. Uh, one warning to men about testosterone supplements. Men with high levels of testosterone have shorter lifespans than individuals who have lower levels of testosterone. So although it might be great to have Thai tea in the short run, in the long run your testosterone is supposed to go down a little bit as you age. So worry about supplementing it because uh, it might shorten your lifespan. Well, Sapolsky... Uh, the science writer found an interesting thing going on with testosterone and dominance hierarchies in a group of baboons. And testosterone and dominant behaviors tend to emerge most strongly when there's instability in the leadership of a troop and different males are fighting for the alpha status. In wild baboons, testosterone predicted behaviors uh, were most obvious and easiest to see when the status hierarchy was unstable. You see a lot of puffing up, a lot of status behaviors, a lot of male aggression. When the testosterone stable, or excuse me, when the hierarchy stabilized, testosterone and behavior were relatively unrelated. And this basic finding has been found in a wide number of other species. Uh, so, bottom line here is when the hierarchy is stable, testosterone and behavior were unrelated. So, the animal literature suggests that when social status is uncertain, 
testosterone levels will change so that males will seek out higher status. Now in men, uh, one interesting study has been done with testosterone levels and uh, corporate executives. So a group of CEOs were recruited into a study and had their level of testosterone assayed through a relatively simple spit test. And then their testosterone was assayed a second time six months after they had retired. And the researchers found that there was a significant drop in the male's base level of testosterone between when they were the sitting corporate CEO and when they had retired. So it seems like we have a base level of testosterone as males, but our testosterone also fluctuates depending on the role we have and the status we have in the group. Now we have to remember one thing about this, in that the cause of dominance behavior related to testosterone or serotonin is difficult to infer from causal data. These are just correlational data. They're not true experimental data. Now in 1969, McGargy did a classic study of dominance. This study has been replicated several times and the data still hold up. What McGargy did was he uh, pre-screened individuals for dot levels of dominance and used the highly dominant men and women and the highly submissive men and women to study. He put them into dyads, groups of two people, uh, with the screen that they had not had known each other. So two strangers are put together. They're pre-screened for dominance. And they're also given a relatively simple learning task to perform. The researcher tells the participants that you have a standard teacher-learner kind of task. You can even think back to learning words like in the classic Milgram study. And, and the researcher tells the two individuals that one person is assigned the role of the teacher and the other the learner. The researcher then says they don't really care who's going to be the teacher and who's going to be the learner. So he makes an excuse, leaves the room, and tells the participants to decide who's going to be the teacher and learner while the researcher is out of the room. Well, when the researcher leaves the room uh, in 1969, tele uh, tape recorders started whirling and recorded the conversations of went, that went on. Uh, in later replications, tape recorders and later video recorders were used and came with the same basic findings. So here's the setup. You have uh, dominant men paired with submissive men, uh, dominant women paired with submissive women, and these four mixed sex diets. You had a dominant male, paired with a dominant female, a dominant male paired with a submissive female, a submissive female paired with a dominant male, a submissive male paired with a submissive female, in other words, two wimps. So, I want you to pause the video, take a minute, and uh, make up a little grid that looks like this slide, and then check off who do you think becomes the teacher in these four dyads. Does the man become the teacher in the dominant-dominant dyad, or does the woman? Same for the other three groups. When you've done that, uh, start up, and I'll tell you the results of these studies. Okay, well, hopefully you've got your findings there. Let's see if you've guessed the research results. In the same sex pairs, 75% of the dominant men, 70% of the dominant women assume leadership roles. That's very unsurprising. In the first mixed sex pair, 90% of the men in the high dominant group 
high dominant man, low dominant woman pair, assumed leadership. Not too surprising. In the high dominant woman, low dominant man group, only 20% of the women assumed the leadership roles. Well, this is an interesting finding. What's going on here? Why are 80% of the women taking the submissive role uh, and being and uh, doing this in when they're patched up with or matched up, excuse me, with a uh, submissive guy? You're going to find the answer to this quite intriguing. Well, upon analysis of the tapes, McGargy discovered that the dominant women were appointing the low dominant men to the leadership positions and really are being the dominant individual, but they're not taking the titular role. They're just being dominant. In fact, the dominant women made this decision 91% of the time pretty profound percentage. Now, the notion here is that men and women use dominance in different ways. And uh, we'll get into that a little bit the next time, or not the next time, but in the next study. I would speculate that uh, the women saw this uh, for what the task was. They didn't see it as a competitive situation. Uh, they saw it as a Psych 10 study. Uh, you want to get in, you want to get out as quick as possible. So you be the teacher, uh, I'll be the learner, let's get done and let's move on with our lives. But it also demonstrates an important thing about differences in dominance between men and women. In 1973, Edwards and Whiting published a paper about dominance and found that there were two major forms of dominance and they were very sex linked. First of all you get egoistic dominance. Egoistic dominance is dominance for your own selfish ends. I order you to do something because it's not necessarily good for you but it's good for me to do that thing. Pro-social dominance is dominance that's good for the entire group and good for everyone. And this is the major sex difference that we find. Men tend to be egoistically dominant and do things for their own selfish ends. Women tend to be more often pro-socially dominant and do things for the good of the group. Well, here I am again. Let me uh, tell you a story about this. One of the things about doing these videos is I find I don't get to tell my stories as much. Uh, let me tell you about the difference between an egoistic professor and a pro-social professor. When I was in graduate school, I worked with the author of your textbook, David Buss. And in Buss's research group, uh, everything was pretty egoistical. Uh, most of my meetings about my thesis with Buss were really about his data analyses I was doing with him or his work. And uh, he used a lot of people up and generally you did things that were good for David not necessarily that were good for you. Uh, this was opposed to another personality psychologist who worked at Michigan at the same time, a woman named Nancy Cantor. Now, if you worked for Nancy, uh, you had regularly scheduled meetings, uh, group research meetings with Boss. We never had any... Uh, team meetings, all of our individual meet, or all of our research meetings were one-on-one. -on -one. If you worked for Nancy, you were, uh, you knew what everybody else was doing in the lab. Uh, from an important point of view, if you worked with Nancy, uh, you got first authorship 
on a Journal of Personality and Social Psych article. Uh, this journal has over a 90% rejection rate, and for a graduate student, it's essentially a job ticket. Everyone coming out of Nancy's lab had a publication where they were first author. Typically, as a backup, Nancy's students also had a book chapter where they were first author on some of their research. And she would frequently have social occasions for her students, parties, and stuff like that. Uh, Bus did that about once a year because, well, he kind of had to. I was uh, observing what was going on there. And in the long run, in hindsight, let me kind of tell you what was going on. Virtually every one of Nancy Cantor's students came out and got a tenure track academic job. Not all of them made tenure and promotion and kept their jobs, but she got them all on the tenure track. Of that first group of Michigan bus students, I was the only one out of the four or five of us to get an academic job. He started to have a much better track record uh, with David Schmidt and the group of folks that followed him. But I was the only person that got an academic job coming out of those early years of David Buss's work at Michigan. I did get my JPSP article, and uh, obviously I got a professor's job because I'm yakking to you right now. Uh, in the long run, when I came to Fresno, I set up my research group as pro-social as I possibly can. And I have regular grab meetings with my students, uh, as regular as I can get everybody together with our different schedules. I try to have a couple of parties a year uh, to socialize with people. And uh, can't get my students JPSP articles because they take three or four years to foster. But I do get my students conference presentations where their first author is on, on a regular basis. So, from an evolutionary point of view, um, I'm kind of acting more female. Uh, now, Buss continues to be a very eminent evolutionary psychologist. He's moved on to the University of Texas, Austin. Nancy Cantor moved into administration and has uh, been the president of major universities like the University of Illinois, Princeton, and most recently, last time I tracked her down, Syracuse University. So she continues to exhibit strong leadership skills. Well, that's a little bit more on dominance and behavior. In the third unit, we'll finish off our lecture on dominance, and I'll show you an interesting study about changes in dominance across generations of Russian silver foxes. So this is Dr. B signing out for Lecture 16, Volume 2, Evolutionary Psych.